our next speaker is um, Professor Antonio Castroneto. He really needs no introduction. He's like the, um, the, the main catalyst behind much of 2D materials uh, research in Singapore. Um, you can no hear me. Worries, thank you. Can't hear me. Maybe that's that's the issue. Sorry about that. Okay, so so um, uh, we we have Professor Antio, uh, Antonio um, Castroneto, and um, you know he, he really needs no introduction. He's he's uh, uh, basically the the pioneer behind lots of 2D materials research in Singapore. Um, and as you can see, you know um, I, I'm actually very curious to, to, to find out if 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 Andrew might might agree that you know it's it's when when you arrived that you know most of the the, the 2D materials kind of um, research kind of um, took off. Um, of course, that kind of coincided with the large surge of research funding. Um, and so, so he's, he's here to tell us um, quite similarly from this morning, Quantum Island, he's, he's going to say Graphene Island. So, so thank you very much, Antonio. Thank you. Thank you, Justin, for the invitation to come here. Um, as I was mentioning to this gentleman here, uh, this is the kind of talk you give when you are you get old, and I feel very old giving this talk, <laughs> because it's a sort of historical perspective of what has happened, uh, you know, in the last 13 years in Singapore since I arrived here. Um, so many things happen, and uh, I'll try to give you know uh, a very personal view. It's not the the objective here is not to be. Uh, precise or you know give you the details but give my personal view of the history of graphene in Singapore so this is um, a search on the web of science if you put topic graphene asterisk then uh, you look at how uh, you know uh, institutions in Singapore and you look at the number of of papers published, so this is published, okay, so this is not numbers of paper written, it's published. As a function of time, you see this tremendous growth in the number of publications, okay? And so there are some events here, so this is of course when graphene was, discovered is an abuse of language, when graphene was isolated for the first time, but uh, by Andrea Geim and Costa Novoselov and colleagues in Manchester. And actually, this is the first theoretical paper published uh, uh, by a, a, a Singaporean group on graphene. So it was quite early. Uh, uh, and then uh, a few years later, we have the first experimental paper. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And actually, uh, it was this paper that brought my attention to Singapore uh, at the time. I remember uh, uh, talking to Andrea Geim and I said, look, even in Singapore they are doing graphene, <laughs> you know? And I said, oh, this is great, right? So this was uh, 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 around 2006. And of course, uh, I moved to Singapore in 2010 and uh, I want to publicly <laughs> acknowledge Andrew Wee, who is right here, uh, without Andrew, I, I think, you know, uh, we would not be where we are. I definitely would not be here, and I think Novoselov would not be here. So, you know, the, Andrew is really the person who made it happen at NUS. We are very grateful to him. At the time, he was dean of the science. It was tremendous support to everything. So, uh, this was creation of Graphene Center. In 2014, uh, we became Center for Advanced 2D Materials. So NRF uh, started funding us, uh, and uh, we broadened the scope of what we we're doing initially from graphene to other 2D materials. And incredibly, these numbers to me are incredible, actually. More than 6,000 papers published, essentially, 363 papers published per year. More than one, it's essentially one paper published per year, per day, in Singapore alone. Okay? And you see it plateau around 650 published papers 
per year. These numbers are incredible. Okay, so uh, this is why I, I, I truly believe that uh, Singapore is a graphene island. Okay, it's, uh, it has had a tremendous impact and uh, I think that many people in this audience here contributed to this. Uh, and I'm going to give you a little bit, these are of course prehistory. <laughs> These are the two papers uh, that gave essentially the Nobel Prize to Novoselov and Guy. So this is in October to, uh, 2004, uh, and uh, electric field effect in atomically thin carbon films. They didn't even call it graphene then. We learned the, the, the word graphene later. <laughs> And then this was already in 2005, the two-dimensional gas of massless direct fermions in graphene, where they measure for the first time the quantum Hall effect. Uh, in fact, this paper was not very well accepted. It was seen in the early days as a sort of curiosity uh, that they were able to take graphite, exfoliate, and make a device out of it. The paper that I credit for the Nobel Prize is this one, because this paper really proved that there were Dirac fermions in, in, in graphene, which was for solid state physics, for condensed matter physics, it changed everything. Right, so this is, uh, and here they are receiving their medals uh, in 2010. Ah, I was lucky enough to be there with them uh, at the time was it's a big party. If one day you are invited, you should go. It's a great party to be in. Okay, so this was in 2010. So this is prehistory. Uh, the first theoretical paper came from NTU. Um, in fact, by Reddy, Rajesandran, and uh, uh, Professor Liu. Uh, actually, I, I think Professor Liu now is Hong Kong, if I understand correctly. Uh, these gentlemen, uh, I think they are at the National Supercomputer Facility. They actually are people who do model materials. And in fact, they wrote a paper on graphene before graphene. So this is the first paper published after graphene was discovered. Quite interesting to me that they were quite ahead of their time in when, when they published that. Okay. So, uh, and the, on the experimental side, uh, this was the paper actually, uh, if you look on Web of Science, this is the first one that appears there, if you do this search that I did. And in fact, it was the first paper I read from Singapore, uh, surface uh, transfer p-type doping of taxographene by people here in the audience. Eh? So, Chen Wei and, and Andrew, and Andrew, right there, and um, uh, quite early, actually, you know, this was already, you know, in 2006, 2007. So uh, they were already looking uh, at uh, uh, graphene, epitaxial graphene, uh, which was, and it is, one of the uh, most studied cases of graphene, you know. So this is quite early as well. And uh, when I moved here in 2010, uh, so in the early days, uh, so this is a photo from 2011. So this, we organized quite a few conferences here in Singapore. So uh, in the early days, we, we wanted to create awareness of uh, graphene was happening in Singapore. So in fact, what we did is that we organized several conferences, we invited everybody to come here and so on. So to create a bus around Singapore as being a hub for graphene research. So this was one of the first things we did when we came to Singapore. And in fact, here's Andrew. So all these uh, things actually helped a lot uh, in the early days uh, to uh, bring attention of the international community to Singapore in terms of what was being done here uh, uh, for graphene research, right? Uh, notice this photo, because I'm go going to come back to this photo. It's an interesting story uh, of this. This is the, uh, the labs that we build uh, in the uh, fact of science at NUS. 
So this is historical photos that you're not going to find on the web. They are my personal photos. Okay, so to show you how it worked, this is <laughs> how it started. This is S14 at NUS <laughs> during the construction of the clean room. And this is S14 level one, and this is S14 level two. So these are very old photos when we started. There was nothing. So uh, in fact, there's, a, there's an interesting story. So S14 was the uh, Department of Mathematics. And you know, the whole infrastructure was not <laughs> prepared for labs. So it, it had to be completely uh, 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 redone in order to accommodate labs, not even the positions of the pillars uh, in the middle of the clean room. All these were big challenges for us to build this, this infrastructure in, in the very beginning. So this is actually a photo of inside of the clean room before the clean room was clean. So this was actually during the construction, and you can see there is no, 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 no equipment inside. And, uh, 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 it's uh, now this is completely full of equipment. In fact, the clean room became small now because it's so there are so m many things going on there. We have so many users. Now the clean room has around 200 users. So uh, uh, and uh, it's quite busy. But you know this is how it looked like uh, uh, 13 years ago, not 13, uh, 10, 10 years ago. So this is actually uh, a photo from late 2011. So this is how our labs look like. You can see the, all these glass uh, windows and very open structure, very modern looking. And this is how it looked in January 2012. This was completely destroyed by fire. The whole floor, <laughs> the fl whole floor caught fire and the whole work of months was destroyed in a few hours, right? So, you know, at these times there is this famous uh, 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 quote from Seneca, who was this uh, Roman philosopher who said, fire tests gold, a diversity tests brave men. In this case, the diversity by fire <laughs> tested us. You know, uh, uh, it was uh, a very difficult period for us because, uh, uh, you know, we had already students starting their thesis there. We had already uh, experiments going on, and essentially students have to delay their defense. It was uh, uh, a big uh, uh, traumatic time for us. Uh, uh, of doing this, and we had to deal with the insurance. Uh, you have no idea. It's, it's, uh, it's, it, it was terrible. And this is how it looks like afterwards. So not so nice looking like this, because now these walls can resist five hours of fire. You know? So it, we have to change from the, this nice, good looking open structure to one that uh, all the walls are uh, against fire. We had to put all sorts of uh, 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 fire safety things, uh, features into the, 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 the labs and so on and so forth. But this is part of our history. This is part of uh, what we, we went through. And of course, we have the grand opening. So this is George Schwann he, when he was the president of NUS uh, and uh, the people, in, uh, including Andrew here, so, and Kostya, looking very thin by the way, I should show him this photo. He's looking very thin in this photo here. You see a, 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 a photo from yesterday. He doesn't look like that anymore. <laughs> so you see, uh, and this is the, the uh, of course, uh, the, uh, the deputy prime minister uh, uh, there with us. Uh, and here it's him making graphene with Costia by his side in the clean room for the first time. So this is how we started with very strong support uh, from the university, uh, from the government, uh, and of course we're very grateful. And uh, you know it, it, that's one of the reasons why uh, I think we succeeded. Without that support, it would not be possible. So then, as I said, in 2014, we became the Center for Advanced Study Materials. Again, the Deputy Prime Minister here, Lo Tak Seng, 
uh, uh, Charles Chouan and, and people there. And then, actually, uh, we brought many uh, 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 very famous people to teach classes. So this is Andrea Harensch, so who is very well-known guy in scanning and tunneling microscopy. He came to, to NUS to teach a class. This is uh, 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 Silvia Gradeschak, who at the time was not faculty at NUS. She, she was a professor at MIT and came to teach a class on electron microscopy. It was very successful, by the way. So, and uh, we had many of these courses. This is Greg Stewart. It's a big class on superconductivity. So the, the nice thing about what we had is that we had very good people from all over the world willing to come, willing to teach classes about you know, uh, their specialties to their students. So they really uh, uh, got first class attention. And uh, I think this is, uh, we are very proud of that, that we're able to bring people who are interested in coming and visit us and, and do things like this. This was great. So just to give an idea, because you know, I think uh, it's important to compare what we have done and with other centers uh, uh, you know, uh, around the world. So, and there are several of them here. So I have two different um, uh, names. So CA2DM, uh, as it started in 2014, and then uh, CA2DM with Graphene Research Center, so before 2014, okay? So, because essentially it was just a change of name, really. There was no change. The people involved were the same. Everything was the same. We just changed name because of the funding. And as you can see, this is uh, Manchester, the, birth, the birthplace of graphene, okay? National Graphene Institute in Manchester. This is uh, the Graphene Center in Cambridge. Uh, this is in Italy. Uh, this is uh, in Denmark, uh, in Beijing, Penn State, Exeter, and so on. So this is number of publications. So, you, you know, so essentially we published uh, way more than uh, everybody else uh, uh, in the world. And then uh, this is age index. So this is essentially counts the number of papers with uh, the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the citations, the impact of the papers, right? So this is, again, you see, uh, we way ahead of, of, for instance, Manchester and the UK um, in terms of the impact. So this is number of citations now, same story. So the statistics the, the shows us that, you know, that we really had a, we have, actually, a center of excellence here in Singapore. We have had a big impact in uh, this field. And I think that one of the reasons why Novoselov moved to Singapore two years ago was because we had that infrastructure. Otherwise, he would not move. He's a Nobel laureate. Why he would come here if he had a better situation in Manchester, right? So, in fact, uh, even if you look at field-weighted cit uh, citation impact, so this is weighted by the field, we are uh, ahead of the, of the rest. So, um, so we're very proud of our accomplishments. Uh, but one thing that we also push very hard, as someone was asking about industry, is that uh, we see as our responsibility to bring back to society the investment that was made uh, on, on our center by the government, right? So we, we really want to return this. And uh, over the years, we have more than 200 patents, right, on, on our aspects of graphene and 2G materials. Uh, we started uh, six companies, six spin-off companies of the center, and we interacted with many, many, many companies. This is just a list of the ones we are interacting now, but probably we interacted over the years with more than 100 different companies. So we take this, this very seriously, 
Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that the impact will just increase now because the graphene field uh, has reached a sort of uh, maturity, right? So, uh, of course, there is a lot of work on uh, twisted graphene and superconductivity in graphene and all this, but from the point of view of basic science, most things have been understood. So by understanding the basic science of these materials, now we can go to the next step, which is uh, make these materials useful for the world. And I, we believe this is our responsibility, given that you know, we are at the forefront of the research in this field. OK, so as I showed this picture from 2010, this is the picture from yesterday. At, the, at our clean room. So we try to do the same pose, same faces, not exactly the same, but pretty close, you know. Uh, and uh, you now we have both Andre and Costa. So Andre is, uh, Costa is full time, of course, in US now. And uh, Andre comes here uh, quite a lot, several months a year he comes uh, to NUS. So, you know, I think we can claim that. Uh, uh, yes, Singapore is a graphene island. And just one comment. Uh, this shirt here is not this one. I changed shirts <laughs> since yesterday. Okay, guys, thank you so much for your attention. It's a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Antonio, um, that was very interesting. It was uh, very informative. Any questions? Great. One, one, one there. Yeah. I'm sorry, what? Yeah, well, oh, what the reason for the fire. For the fire. Uh, it was uh, a postdoc who did uh, uh, an overnight reaction. Uh, he did not. Uh, he did not follow protocol. So thanks God, nobody was hurt. But it, the fire caught up in the like two, three in the morning. When I arrived there, seven in the morning. The only thing I saw was charcoal. You can imagine how my heart broke right at that time. It was crazy. More questions. So actually, just. Um Coming off that question, was it completely covered by insurance? Huh? Was, was, there, was the damage completely covered by insurance? Yes, it was. Also, NUS has very good insurance. <laughs> <laughs> paid 90% nine, paid of the cost of rebuilding. Yes. But don't, don't you know, it's very hard to work with insurance companies. <laughs> Your, uh, what other, so we have uh, from your stock, uh, Prof. Shen's stock, we can see the gradual subsidence of high energy physics and the gradual rise of material physics. What other areas do you, and also from Craig's stock, the rise of quantum information, what other areas do you see going down or going up? Oh, the trends, the current yeah. trends? In, in Singapore. Singapore. In Singapore. Yeah. Um, I think there is a lot being done on these uh, twisted structures, right? So since the discovery of superconductivity a few years back uh, by the MIT group, there is a tremendous interest uh, on this. But unlike the, you know, what we worked on you know, uh, 18 years ago, it's way more complex physics, even from the experimental perspective, than what we did before. So it's another level of entrance in terms of publications and so on and so forth. So this is a big one right now. Of course, the other things uh, is uh, uh, what was mentioned uh, before here is all these other 2D materials. So there is a huge family of those, and they are very interesting on their own right, right? Uh, uh, and uh, 
semiconductors. Uh, people are using 2D semiconductors now uh, together with traditional silicon uh, technology. There is a lot of things going on right now uh, in this area. Great. So thanks for the questions. Um, if there are more questions, I think let's uh, thank Antonio for that very interesting talk. Thank, thank you. you.